This is episode 44 of the Life in Norway show. The episodes with the Canadian and British ambassadors to Norway have been some of the most popular so far, so I'm delighted to welcome another ambassador onto the podcast today. Ambassador Jocelyn Baton Garcia is the Philippines ambassador to Norway and Iceland. We talk about the links between Norway and the Philippines, the importance of the shipping and maritime industries to both countries, and the everyday life of an ambassador in Norway in 2020. You can find out more information on today's show on the show notes page. Head on over to lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and look for episode 44. Happy listening. I'm joined today by Ambassador Jocelyn Baton Garcia. She is the Philippines ambassador to Norway and Iceland. Ambassador, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, you're actually the third ambassador to have graced the Life in Norway show, so I am building somewhat of a collection as we go on. Um, on the show today, we'll talk about the relationship between Norway and the Philippines and also the role of an ambassador in 2020. Uh, but first, let's find out a little bit about you and your story. So what brought you to Norway? Well, this is my third ambassadorial position. And uh, when Norway was offered to me, uh, that was in 2018, I very happily accepted especially because at that time, our embassy in Oslo had coverage over all the Nordic countries. Mm. So I have never been to the Nordic countries before then. So it was indeed a pleasure to be able to visit this beautiful area. So what about your background before you took this role? Uh, I mean, you, you don't necessarily study at 18 to become an ambassador. So what's your background? Is it, is it law or like in, international relations or, or something else? Actually, my undergraduate was Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service. Ah, so you, you can study to be an ambassador, it seems. <laughs> well, uh, it was my undergraduate course for law. Because in the Philippines, one has to have four years of undergraduate schooling before one can um, enroll in the College of Law. So our Bachelor of Laws requires a Bachelor of some course prior to acceptance to the College of Law. I see. So uh, Foreign Service has been interesting for me because I grew up in the foreign service. It was a good undergraduate level schooling. Mm. Although I really actually wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. And uh, so I did pursue becoming a lawyer. And um, after I finished my law studies, my Bachelor of Laws, after studying for many years in the Philippines to finish Bachelor of Laws, it will take at least eight years of undergraduate level and four years in the uh, graduate level Bachelor of Laws uh, course. And I also joined the Department of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. uh, soon after I entered law school. So I was a struggling evening student. Uh, but I finally finished and... Um, I joined the department uh, fully, not only as a working student anymore. And my first assignment was in Japan, in Tokyo, after which I was assigned to Washington, D.C., and later to Caracas, Venezuela, and Bangkok, Thailand, before I came to Oslo. Wow. It's been a long journey. Yeah, all around the many, world. Many, years. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the, the beautiful Nordic lands. Uh, what, what was the reason you said yes, uh, having not traveled here? Was there something about the lifestyle or the society here? Uh, I assume it wasn't the weather that attracted you to, to Oslo. No, well, the 
weather wasn't exactly my primary consideration, although I was a little bit afraid about having very long winters. But being a foreign service personnel, one accepts a job that is given to you. And um, I was lucky enough to have accepted a job which I really like in a place that has beautiful uh, environment. So I don't regret it at all. Mm. As a matter of fact, I am enjoying uh, my stay here. My first year or so was very, very busy because I had to travel to uh, uh, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, and Denmark. But subsequently, we have developed more areas. Uh, So we have opened an embassy first in Copenhagen. And this year, we uh, established an embassy in Stockholm with coverage over Sweden and Finland. So now I am concentrating on Norway and Iceland. So I'm able to travel to more places in Norway than I was able to in my first year and a half. Excellent. So we will talk a lot more about Norway as as we go on with the interview. But let's talk a bit about the Philippines, because I know a lot of my listeners to the show that I've heard of the Philippines, but perhaps they won't know a great deal about the country. And, and I know from having researched the Philippines that there's a lot of surprising facts that, that come up, such as the, the population, for example, and, and many other things. So can you give us a, a brief introduction to, to your homeland? Well, the Philippines is uh, an archipelago in the Pacific. We are south of Taiwan, north of Indonesia. There are 7,641 islands in the Philippines, uh, plus a few more that um, have not been completely named. (laughs) (laughs) We are 110 million people, uh, mostly English-speaking but we also have 87 different languages and 121 different dialects. So uh, a Filipino from the north may not understand the language of the Filipinos in the south, but we do have a common national language, which is Filipino. It is basically uh, 90% Tagalog, which is the... um, the language in the region near Metro Manila, around Metro Manila. The capital is Manila. Uh, The metropolis is composed of about, has a population of about um, 11 million at daytime. Uh, Sorry, 11 million at nighttime, 13 million at daytime. So there are a lot of commuters. And because we're islands, we have quite a number of beautiful beaches and island territories. Uh, I'm very proud to say that in July 2020 this year, Palawan, which is in the um, western, southwestern side of the Philippines, was hailed as the best island in the world by travel and leisure. And it is for the fourth time. I have to say, Ambassador, you are doing a wonderful job at selling the Philippines. Um, but let's uh, let's bring things back to Norway, uh, because the reason you're you're here in Norway is that there are a lot of Filipinos living in Norway, and that, uh, despite what people may think, there are a lot of uh, relationships between the Philippines and Norway economically. Um, now, I suspect that a lot of that relationship is to do with the the water and the ocean, and I know there's a lot of people from the Philippines that are involved in the shipping industry, and maybe there's some other links as well. So could you tell us a little bit about the the various relationships that the Philippines and Norway have? The greatest contribution, actually, of the Philippines to Norway and its economy is the presence of about 23,000 to 25,000 Filipino seafarers on board Um, Norwegian flagged or Norwegian owned vessels both in the cruise industry and on oil platforms 
they perform various works from what is menial, taking care of uh, uh, the kitchen, the hospitality areas, or being engineers in laying down uh, la pipelines as well as cable lines in various parts of Norway. Uh, there are also quite a number of Filipinos here, about 25,000, many of whom are health workers. And a good number have, have immigrated to Norway having married Norwegians. But there are also former Filipinos who have uh, become Norwegian citizens. And they are in various parts of the Norwegian bureaucracy, I mean, government, and also in the private sector. You mentioned 25,000. Is that in addition to those that are on the ships or is that the total figure? There are approximately 23,500 Filipinos on land in Norway. Mm. And there are about 23,000 to 25,000 on average, Filipinos on board Norwegian ships, they, and they could be actually anywhere in the world. So we've, we've looked at shipping and maritime, and you've mentioned healthcare as well, in terms of what fi people from the Philippines are doing in Norway. How about any, any broader economic links? Are there any other industries that are important for the two nations? We'd like to have more, but yes, we do have, we export ICs, fish, and aluminum parts, and we import from Norway fertilizers, a lot of salmon, almost all the salmon entering the Philippines come from Norway, <laughs> ICs and various types of um, uh, salt, as well as tourism. There are about 23,000 to 24,000 Norwegian tourists who uh, go to the Philippines. There are less coming to Norway, although because of the Aurora Borealis, more and more people are becoming familiar with uh, Norwegian tourism. Oh, that's interesting. What is it about the Aurora Borealis that, that draws people? Has it been covered on, on television in the Philippines or are there other means that people are discovering the, the phenomenon? Because there are now a lot of uh, people to people exchanges mm. and there are a lot of Filipinos on board ships. And lately, there have been Filipinos on board ships going to the Arctic Circle. So that is the reason why more and more families are beginning to wonder, wow, maybe we should go and see the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> as well as, you know, movies. Yeah. Filipinos probably earlier on thought of Norway more as the home of the Vikings. Right. You know, Thor. <laughs> Yes, of <laughs> <Those> course. <laughs> are, uh, <laughs> what Filipinos would probably have known about Norway, aside from, of course, the seafaring mm. industry. And since the Philippines is uh, the third largest supplier of seafarers in the world, there are a lot of seafarers who've gone around and they have found Norway as some of them have found Norway as a home mm. and have settled here. And then they invite their families to visit them. And word goes around. Now, with the technology, uh, it is so easy to see, to show beautiful pictures. And one beautiful picture shared by one can be shared by hundreds, if not thousands. And I think that is what technology has uh, contributed to Norwegian tourism. <laughs> Excellent. So... Uh Another thing technology can contribute, of course, is to have interviews on, on podcasts that can be heard by people all around the world. Uh, and I know one question that people will have, and it's one that I have as well, is what exactly does an embassy do in this day and age? What, what, what is the role of, uh, of the ambassador position and the embassy in general? Okay. Well, our main role, of course, is to promote our country, our culture and our people and also to maintain uh, good relations with the host countries and to promote investments and trade and tourism, as well as 
the third pillar of our diplomacy is promotion and protection of Filipino nationals. Mm. And that is an area that is very important for us because we do have a diaspora of about 10 million people and 23,000 of them are here. Now, when I started uh, under my jurisdiction at the time, there were about 55,000 Filipinos. So servicing their passport needs, visa needs for their spouses and boyfriends and friends, and of course, promoting, uh, providing passports and visas is an, another important uh, function that we have. But equally important would be our promotion of investment to the Philippines and increasing of bilateral trade. What does a typical day look like for you? Uh, I, I imagine that you're in a lot of meetings, uh, you maybe travel a lot, or, or are you like the rest of us and you're stuck uh, behind email for most of the day? How does it work? Well, on a normal note, I would have a lot of meetings with the, the, minist- the different ministries, especially with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the different government entities, the different embassies, and the private sector. I'd have a lot of meeting with them. I'd also get a lot of instructions from Manila that I have to respond to. Mm-hmm. And uh, my our people would be processing documents which are requested of us, like passports, visas, authentication, and other legalization of documents. But I also would go out a lot to visit um, Filipinos in the different parts of the country as well as visit business concerns which are of interest to us. And as I said earlier, we do invite investments to the Philippines. And if I may say so, the CEO World Magazine had included the Philippines as top 10 countries to best invest in or do business in 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 2020. And we've been in the top 10 list for uh, being excellent business and advice and investment um, destinations for quite a number of years. With publicity like that, do you have small and medium-sized Norwegian businesses coming to you for information, or is it more that you you are going out and promoting the opportunity that that the Philippines could provide to a Norwegian business? Well, we do both. We go out and we also um, accept Uh, requests for information but we would like to have more ambassador we can't record a podcast in 2020 without talking about the coronavirus pandemic unfortunately Uh, at the time of recording it's still going on there are still restrictions in place uh, in in norway in terms of travel Uh, how has it impacted your job and the lives of residents of the philippines that are living in norway oh my The corona (laughs) pandemic has impacted us considerably, like in many other places in the world, uh, but even much more than Norway, Uh, partly because we have a much larger population. We have had to make very difficult decisions where we had to lock down the country at some points in time. We had to prevent the entry of uh, many people, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have had to arrange numerous uh, repatriation flights, but we also had to limit even that in order to ensure that we can treat people as best we can. How have things been for the, the tens of thousands of Philippine nationals living in Norway? I imagine you've had a lot of questions from them about travel uh, and and I imagine they've not been able to travel home and and friends and family have not been able to visit Norway for what around six months now or so. Well it's very sad for them because normally the Filipinos here in Norway whether they have become Norwegian citizens or they have remained Filipino citizens would visit the Philippines at least once a year some two to three times a year especially those who are already retired. Unfortunately, of course, we've had restrictions and uh, we get uh, requests for information 
quite frequently. We have put up the advisories in our website, in our Facebook and Twitter accounts, but they still do call. And even Norwegian tourists still ask if they can come to the Philippines. And sadly, we, we have to say, please come next year. Sure. Well, the coronavirus and, and the situation in, in Norway and the Philippines, it's obviously a very serious issue. But uh, I want to bring the conversation around to a, a little more lighthearted topic now as we as we come towards the end of the show. Uh, one of the things that uh, I like to see when a new ambassador is appointed here in Norway, they get to meet the king. And I would love to hear about your experience of meeting King Harald. Uh, what actually happens at, at those meetings? Oh, it's actually a standard presentation of credentials. Uh, one is invited to the palace on a specific date, and uh, uh, one meets the different official. One is introduced to the different officials in the palace, and then is introduced to His Majesty the King. It's it's a rather simple ceremony. But it's always an honor and a pleasure for a diplomat to be able to present his or her credentials to the head of state, in this case, His Majesty. Do you get much time to have a, a, a bit of a chat or is it all very formal and a, and, and a short ceremony? It's a short ceremony, but uh, we do get an opportunity to have uh, discussion with his majesty hmm. who is a very kind and uh, person and uh, when you're talking to him he's almost like a grandfather <laughs> excellent uh, ambassador do you have a message for any filipinos who may uh, live in norway and might be listening to the show today anything to say to them mga kababayan magandang hapon ho sa inyong lahat Sana po tayo ay maging malakas at matatag. Wonderful. Now, to end the show, Ambassador, I will ask you the same questions I ask every guest on the Life in Norway show. So some uh, some quick answers, please. Uh, what do you like best about living in Norway? The beautiful environment, the clean air, the long walks in the wooded area. They are wonderful. Fantastic. Now, what do you find most challenging about living in Norway? The most challenging in life in Norway was the minus 35 degrees in Roros. <laughs> I, I have been to Roros myself. It's not far from here in Trondheim. Uh, now, whilst it wasn't minus 35, it was an extremely cold day. And of course, inland in Norway, you do get those really cold temperatures. So, uh, how, I mean, how did you cope? You were wrapped up nicely, I, I suppose. Yes, I was very well wrapped up. <laughs> Excellent. Now, last uh, last question, Ambassador. You've, you've given a few answers to this already, but what's your favourite place in Norway? My favourite place? Actually, my apartment. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Why, why do you say that? Because from my apartment, I can see the Oslo Fjord. I can see home in Kolon. I can see a lot of greenery and beautiful sunsets. Lovely. <laughs> Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Uh, where can people find out more about you and the services offered by the embassy? Anybody who is interested uh, of, in finding out how to go to the Philippines or to know about us, please uh, check www.philembassy.no. And also in our Facebook, PH in Norway. That's great. And I will include links to the website and the Facebook page of the embassy on our show notes page for this episode, which you'll be able to find at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast. Uh, Ambassador, this has been really interesting. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. 